questions about this coming Sunday's game and uh, how dialed in you guys have already started the process uh, and, and your thoughts about the Rams in general? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge game. Uh, it's a division opponent. Uh, they're coming to our house, which is um, a huge thing. We need to be able to protect the nest. Um, you know, I think dialed in, I mean, we get to, to, to partake in meetings virtually today. Uh, we know the entire NFL um, is not allowed anybody to come into the buildings the first two days of the week. So really excited about, you know, being able to actually talk to coaches again, being able to, to, to be able to communicate with teammates. So, um, you know, we know we got a, a big test coming in front of us. So we got a very talented defensive line and, and the Rams coming up. So uh, we have to do a really good job up front. Hey, Calvin, um, and getting to know the rest of the O-line room, um, what was it like kind of, I know that you knew DJ Humphreys before you got here, but getting to know everyone else and what are some funny moments from this season of just that group in general? You know, I also trained with uh, Pew this off season as well. So got to spend some time with him as well. Um, you know, you got a good mix uh, of guys who play some ball. Uh, you got some young guys, uh, you know, we had, um, we got our, our residential rapper in Josh Miles. So we actually have a, a, a rap battle every Friday, uh, right before we um, right before we start start practice. So it's always great to hear him uh, on Fridays. But we got a great group, got a great group of guys, guys that enjoy working, um, which I appreciate as as a guy that's been in the league for a little while. Um, guys that just enjoy working, guys that that ground for each other, that love each other, um, that you know, put ego aside and find a way to, to, to collaborate, to, you know, make sure that we're doing everything that we can to protect our quarterback. Next up, Mike Jarecki, Kyle Odegaard, Darren Urban. Hi, Calvin. We know it's a copycat league. Have teams uh, defended you guys different in the last couple of weeks? Um, I would say if you come from the Belichick tree, there's a way in which those teams have defended us. So if you look at our losses um, to Detroit, to Miami um, and to New England this past weekend, those teams all approached us. And my, from, from an upfront standpoint, they all approached us in the same, same way. Um, being able to put um, either a, a, a five-man front, six-man front, or sometimes a seven-man front um, up in front of us to make sure that we weren't able to run the ball in the fashion that we were able to run the ball. Um, so I would say that those three teams have defended us in, in a way. And I think if you look at what Seattle did in game two, they did that five-man front type of defense, six-man front at, at times um, to make sure that they negated the run. So I think teams are, are realizing that, you know, you can't line up in a, a four-man surface um, and beat us. Um, I think teams are coming after us a ton more than they were early on in the season. You know, I think the last two games, we've gotten a lot of zero, um, which is, you know, all-out blitz a lot more than what we'll be getting early on in the season. So they're trying to find a way to get the ball out of Kyler's hands um, extremely fast. So uh, I would say that teams are, um, you know, using the, the, I guess the, the blueprint um, from that, that kind of Belichick tree to, to be able to slow us down. Hey, Calvin, uh, do you think DJ Humphreys has a, a certain level of natural talent that is just impressive to you? Is What what has kind of led to him having a nice season? You know, I would say just his ability to um, move the way he moves. And, and when I say that, it's kind of hard to pinpoint or say that there's a particular feature or a particular characteristic. But DJ moves with a level of suddenness, um, with also a level of smoothness that you're not able to really coach. Um, he has that it factor that, that, that people look for out of, out of a tackle. And I think uh, his ability to always have uh, himself in a great position to be successful um, has just continued to, to bowl while he's one of the top left tackles in the National Football League. So um, it's been impressive to, to be a part of. It's been impressive to watch. Um, it's been impressive to watch him grow. Again, I've trained with him the last couple of years. Um, here out here in, uh, in, in Arizona. So to see him grow and develop as, as a tackle, it's been impressive. And then to see the way it works day in and day out, um, you know, can't say enough about that and his, and his work habits and his work ethic. Kelvin, you, uh, you were just talking about how some of those teams were defending you guys and, and you've been around this league long enough at this point. You know, on the outside, we're all like, OK, why can't there be more consistency with the offense? Are they going to find this consistency on the inside? Is it is it a situation of 
a week to week thing of who you're playing? Uh, or is there a, a level that as a player and as an offense, you guys feel like you can get to that, that would carry over? You know, I think internally, I think we have to fall in love with the mundane. And when I mean fall in love with the mundane, we have to, to do the ordinary things extraordinary. We have to be able to do the simple things right consistently. And I would say throughout the season, there have been times where we've had um, spurts and sprints where those things have been almost automatic, where we've literally been able to go up and down the field on teams. And then we've had opportunities and, and games where um, it just hasn't been consistent. It just hasn't been um, fluid. Um, and that's hurt us. I mean, that's been the reason why, you know, we, we've stumped our toe a number of times this year where we, we have the ability and have the skill set, both, you know, I'm just talking about offensively, both uh, up front and, and, and outside to be able to really put up a lot of points on folks. So, you know, I think that's something that we have to continue uh, to work at, uh, things that we have to continue to, to get better at, um, and things we have to continue to find ways to hold each other accountable to, uh, because we have the skill set. Uh, to do so, we have the players, we have the coaches, we have the staff to do those things. As, as players, we have to find a way to make sure that we're doing that day in and day out so it then translates uh, to what happens on Sundays. Next up, Bob McManaman, Howard Balzer, Catherine Fitzgerald. Kelvin, uh, as an offensive lineman, what, what can you guys do? What are some of the things you can do to, to uh, offset defensive linemen jumping and leaping in the air to distract and knock down Kyler's passes? Uh, it's nothing you can do. Because um, the thing is, is we don't know what's going on behind us. Um, and I would say the two balls that were tipped, one that was tipped by 70, he wasn't jumping. He just had his hands in the air. Um, we, as, a, as an offensive lineman, you don't know what's going on behind you. So you don't know why he has his hands in the air. Um, the other one that was tipped by 50, um, you know, we're on DJ's side. You know, he was DJ was setting him properly, was in the, the perfect position to get ready to block him. Uh, he had jammed a, a, a receiver or, or, or a tight end before they got out on a route and was, I would say, almost five yards away from DJ before he even wanted to make contact and started jumping. So it's in, in that particular fashion, it's hard to, as an offensive lineman uh, to say that we need to know exactly when a guy is jumping and, and being able to, to, to dump him in that particular point in time. Um, but I think it's a combination of, of a number of things. It's a combination of, of teams understanding that, um, you know, Kyler wants to get the ball to certain people, uh, wants to get the ball out. Um, and I think New England did a great job of, of, of jamming receivers, tight ends, running backs um, before they even got into the rush. So that automatically put them behind the eight ball where the ball would normally be coming out on, on, from a timing standpoint. Um, and they just were in a better position to, to, to bat those balls in that particular instance. Hey, Kelvin, a couple things. One, uh, what are your plans with the my, my Cause, My Cleats? And I know that you're doing something with the league, with a TV spot for the Players Coalition. And then second, I'm curious how it's been for you mentally and players throughout this season just – you get a positive, you see what's going on around the league, just thinking, is it going to be me? What's going to happen? All those things. How, how tough has this been from a mental standpoint with everything that you, you guys have had to do with the, all the protocols? For sure. So, you know, as far as my cause, my cleats, um, you know, I think that um, the digital divide has been something that's been exacerbated throughout um, the pandemic where you have people who have and people who have not as far as access to Wi-Fi, access to internet, um, access to high-speed internet. Um, and you think about what's going on here in Arizona with the Navajo Nation and not having access to some, some simple resources. Um, the digital divide and access to technology and devices is something that uh, I find troubling. It's something that I wanted to um, you know, lend my name to and lend you know, this year's cause to. Um, I've done a lot within STEM education for a number of years, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so this year was something, you know, I wanted to be able to talk about the digital divide uh, because that's something that's been going on for the last couple of years. But I think this year has been an area where people really see uh, the stark differences between communities that have the access to, to Internet. Uh, it's a high speed Internet and with everything going virtual. My daughter's actually in the kitchen right now. Um, this is 11. It's going to be 11 o'clock. She's going to get ready to go on her next live session. Um, so realize how important that is because I'm having to go through it. Um, if you talk about the mental aspect of, of the pandemic and playing in the game, 
it's literally a day-to-day -day thing. I'm praying that I, I don't test negative, uh, praying that I can still go out and perform and, and, and be able to go and provide for my family in this particular fashion. Um, but it's been difficult. You know, I, I can't say that it's been easy. Um, you know, me and my wife literally had, to, we had five days to decide whether we were going to send our daughter to school uh, next year. Well, January 4th, when things open back up and considering the cases that are going on outside uh, around the country, you know, we find it hard to be able to send our daughter out uh, and, 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 and put her in this type of environment. And the reason being is because if the cases are high outside and my daughter happens to bring that case into our house because of the cases in the schools that have been shut down um, here in the area. And I take this disease and I get tested in the building. I then have now started this chain effect that's now caused myself to be positive. Others that are around me from a contact tracing standpoint to now be kicked out of the game. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard decision to, to have to make. So mentally, yes, it's been, it's been pretty draining. Um, to have to think about those particular issues, not only my safety, but the safety of my daughter, the safety of my other two kids, the safety of my wife. You know, my wife is in the healthcare field, the safety of her and, and whether she's going to have to get called up to, to go into this particular epidemic, I mean, this pandemic right now. So it's, it's a lot that's having, a, you know, that's been, that's going on for, you know, us and my, us and my family, but I can imagine um, what's going on, you know, for people around the country. And, and even with that being said, I don't have a lot to complain about because we still, you know, we're, we're blessed to play a game um, at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, it's not many people around the country that, that, that have the, the ability that we have to make the money that we make from, from literally playing a game that, you know, a child's game at the end of the day. Um, those sound like really great cleats. This is gonna jump topics pretty aggressively, but um, as far as the run game and getting Kyler involved there, I know that he likes to throw, he, do, he feels he doesn't need to run for the team to be successful, but do you find there's kind of a sweet spot of he needs to run to a certain extent just for the offense to be a bit more dynamic and to, to open up things for other players or where do you see that? You know, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think he loves to run. I think that gets him into the Florida game as well, but the way teams are playing is they're taking, they're literally taking that away. Um, if a back is offset, they're putting two guys on the backside, literally waiting on them. So, you know, I think in the National Football League, you will realize when you start playing long enough, um, people will find a way to take certain things away from you. And you got to find a way to still find ways to win in spite of. So um, the thing is, we've had opportunities to win games in a variety of ways. And we've had and we've lost games in a variety of ways. I think for us moving forward, we got to find a way to win games offensively in a way that it doesn't matter whether Kyler runs for five yards or Kyler runs for, you know, 100 yards. If, if uh, KD and Chase run for 200 yards or they run for 50 yards, or we throw for, you know, 300 or we, you know, throw for 150, we have to find ways to win games. Uh, it doesn't matter how you get it done. Um, it just has to get done. We'll wrap it up with the last three, Cam Cox, Kyle Odegaard, Nick King. Hey, Kelvin, jumping topics again here. I read somewhere where your dad has an auto repair shop back in Texas, and then you could fix a car just as long with the best of them. What did you learn from working with him back in the day? And also, do you still have that green 96 Tahoe? Uh, you should ask some Cardinals players if they still see that green Tahoe pulling up into the parking lot from time to time and parking next to that, uh, I don't know if it's a Maserati or Lamborghini that D-Hop has, but yes, it's still outside. Um, and, you know, the, the, I guess the, what I got from my dad is, is you know, one, getting up early. Uh, I, I love uh, getting up early and, and still trying to beat him and my grandfather up early in the mornings um, because they're able to get work done when people are still sleeping. Um, so I have a deep appreciation for, for what that taught me. Um, and then I think about just finding ways to provide for a family. And that was the way in which my dad and my grandfather provided for their families was, was working on cars. Um, not that I don't love working on cars, but I wanted to find another way to uh, be able to provide for my family. So went a different route in that particular regard, but I can still go and do it. When I go home, um, you know, I'm, I'm Luke Kelvin when I come home. I'm, 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 a, I'm not a football player when I come home. They give me a wrench, they give me a, a car to go work on. They give me, uh, uh, you know, some, I go cut on the air and, uh, you know, 
put stuff together, take stuff apart. You know, I'm a transmission guy. I love pulling transmissions. That was my, my specialty, um, was pulling transmissions, putting them out, pulling them in. Um, you know, I can still go out and work on my, my Tahoe and all my cars, you know, all the cars that we have here. My wife has a, a Nissan. Um, so whatever, I, I'm one of those people, I don't buy anything that I can't work on. Uh, so if I can't work on it, I, I'm not buying it. Kelvin, when you were training with Humphreys a couple years ago, and I'm sure you saw the talent that he had, but early on in his career, he, he didn't play his rookie year, and then he dealt with some injuries. I'm wondering if you ever gave him had some advice early before he'd really solidified himself at left tackle. Did you ever tell him anything to, you know, to keep him on the right track? I don't think I ever talked to, to, to Hump in that particular fashion. You know, the thing is, is every – athlete at some stage deals with injuries, deals with adversity. Um, and I really do think that it's all about how you handle that. Um, and I can say that Hump was one of those guys that, I mean, we still train together, um, train together this off season, um, but we look at each other and I think you study each other and you study what, what folks do and you try to pull from, from what they do and add it to your game or, or pull from some characteristics that they have and add it to your game. Um, and I just think that, Hump was around a number of guys from across the league that just found a way to get it done um, and found a way to, to, to play, play the game at a high level. So um, I wouldn't say that I actually, you know, I, I took him under my wing and, and we sat down and had a, a heart to heart. No, he watched me work and I watched him work. And when you have that ability, iron sharpens iron, you find ways to get better. You realize what you got to do better to make, to make your game better. Kelvin, you mentioned that a lot of these teams are um, play, playing defense differently, and then a lot of them come from the Belichick tree. Do you feel like you guys are still figuring out what adjustments need to be made there? Um, what's kind of the, the solution? You know, for us, the solution boils down to execution. No matter what defense is in front of you, uh, no matter what tree or historical context, uh, that a coach comes from, it comes down to execution. Uh, on Sundays, it's all about execution. Uh, situational football, which is where uh, we lost the game this past Sunday, was execution. Uh, and that's where it boils down to. It's, it's making sure that uh, we're in the right, you know, formation. We're, um, you know, we're, we're, take, we're, we're doing things from an adjustment standpoint to make sure that we have the right angles on certain plays. Um, all those things play a role. Us as players, making sure that we know the adjustments and the details and the intricate part uh, of that play to make sure that we can execute it at a high level. Um, it, it's, it, it goes hand in hand, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to execution. And if we're willing to execute, and when we have executed at a high level, we play complementary football. Um, sometimes we've had games where we've blown people out. Um, we have that ability. But at the end of the day, when you come down to now, this is this is – this is real football. I'm not saying that, the, you know, early in the year wasn't real football, but we're in playoff football right now. December, you have to find a way to win in December um, to have a chance to be in the dance, um, you know, in a couple of weeks. So we have to find ways to execute week in and week out, play in and play out, practice. You know, some people who have their own concepts of practice, but practice is so important. And, you know, we've Cliff has been doing a phenomenal job of making sure that we're working through situations and in, in practice, but that practice has to now translate into the game because the thing is, is all that matters is performance on Sundays. This is a performance-based business right? and there are no guarantees in the performance-based business. So we got to find a way to execute on Sundays and that's, that's flat out what it, what it really means. And, and, and that's really all that matters is executing on Sundays.